Uh, I'll be reading again today to see how I get on with that. Uh, again, I'll try to break off and make eye to camera contact when I can. And I hope that's not too off putting. Okay. Where I ended the last posting, I hope at least, was where the evolving organism began to develop a central nervous system. And here I want to pick up from this point to talk about how representation might operate within this developing central nervous system. And specifically I want to talk about what it is that's being represented. And where I'm going with this narrative is, is in the direction of an account of how these primary developments and mechanisms form the basis for more complex processes that we call thought. I then want to suggest that the structure of that thought, the poetics as I will be calling it, is grounded in the very basic processes that I'm indicating in these few postings here. Okay, in the last posting I talked about the relationship between moving and thinking, particularly citing Rodolfo Linas uh, and his claim that what we call thinking is the evolutionary internalization of movement. What we call thinking is the evolutionary internalization of movement. And I was relating that to the notion of representations and their role in the life of an organism. An organism may evolve to a level of complexity where it is able not only to respond uh, reactively to its environment, but through the construction of internal representations of that environment, of that world, it can be proactive. Such an organism can use representations as the basis for prediction about what would, uh, or what might happen at least, if it were to engage in certain actions. In a sense, it can run small simulations of possible actions through its representation of the world and tailor its actions in the real world according to the results of these simulations. And I'm not really talking about conscious simulations or conscious planning here. It's still happening at a much more uh, basic sensory motor level. In its ability to construct representations might even increase to a point where it is able to represent itself as a being in that world in a stable and consistent way. That's not where I'm going to yet, but I just want to put a flag down that that's one of the indicators that uh, Linas, for example, talks about. Before we go there, though, it might be important to get a clearer sense of what these representations are and how they operate. What is immediately obvious is that it's not the outside world, whatever that means, it's not the outside world that is represented, but the sensations or perceptions associated with that world. Now this has taken me a long time to get my head around, so I'm going to have to talk through this quite slowly, I think. To use the human organism as an example, we don't see the world. Rather, seeing is what we call the interaction between the world and the visual parts of our cognition. Our eyes are not simply portholes which open out onto an unproblematically visual world. The world is seen as it is because we have the kind of eyes that we have. And to, and to describe the world as being inherently visualizable, oops, so I've just scrolled down too far, I lost my screen on a second. To describe the world as being inherently visualizable, that is, it is visible because we can see it, is obviously tautological, it's not explaining anything. It's also incorrect to assume that sense organs are simply passive instruments recording data in particular ways, but otherwise not engaging or interacting with that data. Sensation and perception emerge not from the sensory organs themselves, but from integrated functioning of the somatosensory system, which includes not only the sensory input, but also the motor output. When we feel the surface as rough, not only, not only are we not identifying a property sovereign to that surface, we are also not identifying the passive sensing of inert fingertips. Feeling a surface is experiencing the movements that the fingertips are making across that surface. It is feeling the movements of the skin as it catches and slips from one tiny indentation to another and feeling the squeezings of the muscles and tissues and, on the, and the pressure on the cells of that skin varies with changes in the texture of the surface. 
to take another example seeing an edge the edge of any object involves the eye circading back and forth across a few seconds of arc and this motion being coordinated with that pattern, pattern of changing light on the retina seeing involves this kind of combination of both sensory and motor information and it is this sensory motor synthesis which forms the representations in other words cognitive representations are not pictures of the world they are pictures of what happens in the sensory motor system in relation to that world this concept that perception and action are intimately related in the formation of representations was well covered by the neurologist Roger Sperry. He referred to the process which allows for the internalization of movement as thought as perception action coupling. And more recently, in his book Motor Cognition What Actions Tell the Self, I'm sorry, I don't know how this name is pronounced, I'm going to have a stab at it, but I'm probably getting it wrong. Uh, more recently in his book Motor Cognition What Actions Tell the Self, Mark Giannarod refers to this picturing of sensory mo <coughs> excuse me refers to this picturing of sensory motor syntheses as action representations and such representations form a significant part of his description of cognitive functioning. Okay, if I could just speculate briefly on where this concept of action representation might show itself in modern human experience. It is possible, and this is just speculation I should say, but it is possible that it is this kind of action representation which, when presented to consciousness, forms the basis of emotions such as fear, joy, anger and love. These feelings were described by William James as the perception of bodily changes as they occur. I was going to say that again because it's hard for me to get. The perception of bodily changes as they occur, which is, is kind of a replay of that kind of sensory motor thing, I think. And it seems likely that these coordinated bodily changes are also action representations. This idea that emotions can be understood as the conscious experiencing of sensory motor schema has been revived recently because of findings in neuroscience which lend support to this kind of process. Antonio Damasio has been particularly influential in this area, memorably referring to the way in which somatosensory activity becomes the representational content of human experience as the feeling of what happens. I think it's significant to note actually at this point that there is some evidence that such representations not only instantiate the cognitive connection be between perceiving and actual performed action, but that they also persist when no actual action is carried out. As Marc Giannaro puts it, the core of modern cog uh, beg your pardon, I'll start again. The core of motor cognition is the concept of action representation the covert counterpart of any goal-directed action, executed or not. And it's the executed or not bit that I'm, that I'm drawing attention to here. In other words, even though what's being represented is the coordination of sensory input and motor output, that output may not appear on the surface of the body at all, existing only in the form of simulated action within the cognitive system of the organism. Complementary to this, representation may also occur in the absence of sensory input. In a modern human, we might call this imagining or remembering. This has been described as the cognitive system operating offline, such that the input contributing to the sensory motor synthesis comes not from the senses, but from memory or from somewhere else. As Diane Petra and Rolf Swan put it in their introduction to grounding cognition, offline cognition occurs when sensory motor functions are decoupled from the immediate environment. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty much done with what I want to say today. But this last point that representations can exist within cognition in the absence of either sensory input or motor output is something that I want to come back to later because it's the bit in the middle between the input and the output decoupled 
and and multi-purposed which I want to try and address in uh, if not the next video then a subsequent one okay I think I'm done thanks very much for your patience and uh, good night